Good evening, everyone, and welcome to our webinar this evening, which is the first in a three part series of events looking at the topic of autism in women and girls. My name is Dr. Maria Migone, and I am the clinical director here in Lucina Clinic, which is one of the children's mental health services in Dublin. And this is the first event in the Learning Exchange series of St. John of God Research Foundation. And we're delighted to bring you this event in collaboration with the Autism Special Interest Group of the Psychological Society of Ireland and with the expert support and organization of our colleagues in the psychology department of Lucina Clinic Services. This evening's event combines some pre-recorded and some live presentations. And throughout, you can submit your questions and comments through the uh, questions and answers button on the bottom of your screen. And at the end of the presentations, we're going to hold a live panel discussion with our contributors, and we'll try and get through as many of your questions as possible. Um, if you're tweeting, please use the hashtag AutismWebinar and make sure that you tag us at um, PSI Autism SIG, which is Special Interest Group, and at Research SJOG, which is St. John of God. If you need CPD points from the Psychological Society of Ireland, please email autism at psychologicalsociety.ie after the event. We will have a couple of comfort breaks throughout the session, although they're not very long, but um, you will have time to stretch your feet and we'll do our best to keep this to time and hopefully it will run as smoothly as possible. And I just want to remind you, if possible, please don't share your attendee link with anyone else, because this event is completely booked out and sharing your link means somebody else who is registered for the event will miss out on their place. We are recording this event, though, and the recording is going to be made available publicly. So now, without further delay, I'm delighted to launch proceedings and welcome our first speaker, Jodie O'Neill. But now it's my pleasure to introduce our next guest, who is Jacintha McCormish. And Jacintha McCormish is a qualified counselling psychologist, and she um, got her honours degree in psychology at the School of Psychology in Maynooth. And then she completed her master's degree in counselling psychology um, at the School of Psychology in Trinity College, Dublin. And she has been working with young adults registered with the uh, Asperger's Syndrome Project at Trinity College. And she specializes in working um, with and supporting clients and their families in seeking assessment in relation to autism spectrum disorder and in subsequent psychoeducational work with both children and adults. And her presentation aims to bring you through the process of requesting an autism assessment providing um, you with additional information on the, this procedure. And the focus is going to be on the presentation in women and girls in the context of searching for this assessment. Thanks, Maria. <laughs> and thank you, Jodie, for that fabulous um, uh, presentation, really set the bar very high. <laughs> Um, so, as Maria said, my name is Jacintha McComish and I'm a chartered psychologist. So, what I hope to do this evening is to bring you through um, the process for, for getting a formal diagnosis of autistic spectrum disorder. Um, as I'm sure a lot of you already know, there's, um, there's a lot of people out there who don't need or want a uh, diagnosis and, you know, who identify as autistic without a formal diagnosis. But there's also probably a lot of you out there who are either, you know, thinking about, about the process in terms of their children or themselves. So to, tonight, I hope to go through that process and give you a little bit more information on that. Okay, so we're going to have a look at the ASD diagnostic criteria, have a look at the assessment procedure, and then um, a female presentation. Okay. So the ASD diagnostic criteria, as per the DSM 5 2013, looks at a dyad of um, a dyad of criteria. So there's social communication and then restrictive routines and behaviors. So there needs to be difficulties in both areas to meet to, to meet the criteria for, for diagnosis. So when you go for an assessment, that is what the clinician will be will be looking at. They'll be looking at 
um, your background and you know any information that you have to give them in terms of both of those areas. So we're looking at the um, ASD in terms of social skills, communication skills, both nonverbal and verbal, um, routines and rigidity, so restricted interests and sensory issues, so a combination of, of all of those um, areas. Okay, so what we're gonna have a look at tonight is the procedure for both uh, child assessment and for adult assessment. So um, there's some, so some overlap and there's some areas that are similar on both of them and then there's some that are slightly different. Um, so in terms of, of an assessment for, uh, for a child, you, the clinician would ask you to, to provide as much background information as you possibly can. And if you can give, um, the more information you can give, the easier it is then to, for to the diagnostic uh, interview to be probably as concise and um, as easy as possible. You'll also be asked to complete some questionnaires in relation to your child. So these questionnaires will be looking at both adaptive functioning and executive functioning. And you'll be asked to fill them out as parents um, to get the uh, child's teachers to fill them out. And then depending on the age of the child, there will be some forms that they, that they will be asked to fill out themselves. Um, then again, depending on the age of the child, there will be a school observation in the school setting. Um, there will be a cognitive assessment, diagnostic interview with parents and the child, and then culminating in a report that will summarise all of the information that was obtained throughout the assessment um, confirmation of the diagnosis, if the diagnosis is there, and then um, uh, some recommendations. And for most people, the most important feature are obviously the, the recommendations. For an adult, the procedure is um, pretty much in line with the child assessment, except there'll be some areas that, that, that won't happen. So again, gathering as much background information as possible, um, questionnaires in relation to adaptive functioning and executive functioning, the diagnostic interview, and then the report, which again summarizes everything that happened at the assessment, um, confirmation of a diagnosis, if it is there, and some recommendations. So let's have a look at each of those areas individually now. So um, gathering as much background information as possible. So where possible, so obviously keeping in mind that for, for some adults, it isn't possible to get some of this information. And that does not mean that you can't, can't go through the process, or you can't have assessment, but it's just if possible to provide this information. So in terms of mother's pregnancy and the births, developmental milestones, so um, speech and language, uh, toilet training, and um, motor skills, for example, walking. So as much information as you can possibly provide in advance of the diagnostic interview and then um, any existing reports. So again, for adults, this may, this may not be available to them. They may be aware of an assessment that happened when they were a child, but they may not have the reports. But so as I said, as much information as possible, but don't, don't overstress or don't think, oh God, I don't have that now, I can't do it. Yes, you can. So just what is, if you can give as much detail as possible. Okay, so the questionnaires, again, for both, um, for both children and adults should be provided with questionnaires in relation to adaptive functioning. So adaptive functioning is all our everyday skills. So your communication skills, social skills, daily living skills, self-care, all of the everyday skills. So there's a variety of different ways that can be assessed. So the Vineland and the ABAS are just two examples of, of, of the um, the forms that might be provided to, to have completed it. And as I said earlier, for a child, it will be a parent form, teacher form, and depending on the age of the child, they may have one themselves. And then for adults, um, they will fit, complete that form themselves. Sometimes they might consult with maybe a partner or a sibling or a parent while they're completing them, but it'd be a form that they will fill out themselves. The second um, questionnaire that you would be asked to, to fill in was a, is in relation to um, executive function. So executive function is our organizational skills, our ability maybe to move from one thing to the next. So transitions and organization skills, planning, all of that type of stuff. And again, there be there is a variety of different um, of different tools that may be used here. Uh, the brief is one um, child um, form that may be used, and then the BDEFS is a, a an adult one. 
Again, there'll be similar, there'll be for the children, there'll be a parent, a teacher, and depending on the age of the child, there may be one for themselves. The BDEFS has two, two parts. There's the self-report and then there's the other report. So again, you'll be asked to maybe have somebody, if it's a, if it's, if it's a parent, it's possible, if, you know, maybe a partner, a friend, a sibling, but somebody who may be able to just give a, a slightly different perspective than yourself. But again, don't panic, don't stress. If that's not possible, it's, it's, um, it, it's great if it can be, but it, it doesn't get in the way if it's not possible. Okay, so obviously this piece is only for children. So school or home observation. In the practice that I work in, we, we, we would preferably go for a school observation because it gives you, you know, it gives you a variety of either interactions with the teacher, you know, interactions through the formal teaching, um, school break time, social interactions. Okay, so, so the observer would be just a kind of unidentified observer sitting somewhere in the class, in the back of the class, out of the way, just literally observing what's going on. And for this piece, it is actually really important that the child isn't aware that they are being observed. So, you, you know, it would be somebody the child hadn't met. It'd be, you know, you wouldn't give them any notice or anything like that. Um, the teacher usually from and I, in my own experience, teacher can can introduce you to the class a variety of different ways. You, you, they sometimes they usually focus on it on you being there to watch them. So they might say, oh, just in the, you know, is interested in being a teacher. So she's here to see what it's like or, you know, so but the teacher introduces you and then you kind of stay in the background. So it's really having a look at um, how the child responds to the teacher, their attention, their understanding of any instructions how they interact with each other, you know, how are the, is the child indistinguishable from their peers or is there any noticeable differences and across the break time, you know, just what is their play like, is it solitary, you know, kind of do they interact with their peers? One thing that can that comes up quite a lot in this area is when um, if the assessment is for, for a female child it's quite common that you go into the school and the teacher might go, oh God, I don't even know why you're here, you know, so, um, and it's, it can be really, really interesting because you have to look quite closely maybe to see, to see some of the stuff. So the child might be maybe attached to one other child and kind of following them and taking their lead from them, or they might be slightly on the outside. They might be kind of misunderstanding some stuff in the game. But it's really, sometimes it can be quite difficult to see. And you know, as I said, it's quite common for the teachers not to have noticed because they're watching in general just how things are going on the yard and they're not, you know, they're not noticing small things. Um, so as I said, with girls, it could, it, you need a, a sharp eye and to be really watching, watching the small little interactions. Okay. And the cognitive profile. So again, with children, we would generally do a, a cognitive assessment. And um, what we're trying to see here is the, the overall profile and any kind of inconsistencies or, or kind of what we would might expect to see for a child um, who may end up with a diagnosis of autism or a child who may not. Um, a lot of the time, like it's not unusual for the that the full scale IQ can't be quoted because of the variety in, in, in the different scores. And it's also not unusual for there to be a clear um, difference between, say, verbal and perceptual skills would be along the same lines. And then there might be a dip in ability in terms of working memory and processing speed. So that's that it's not unusual to see that in a pro, in a profile. For, a child who ultimately ends up with, with a diagnosis of autism. Okay, so the diagnostic interview, again, this piece happens for both um, children and for adults. For a child, depending on the child's age, the, the diagnostic interview would happen with the child and the parent, or, or if the child is very young, it would be uh, just with the parents, because it can be quite a long process, so it's difficult to have a, you know, it, three-year-old or four-year-olds present for a three-hour interview. So I know in the practice I work in, what we normally do is we would do both on the one day. So we'd have the child in with the parents for the kind of the observation piece, a little bit of interaction, and then the child would go to a separate room with the educational psychologist to have the cognitive piece completed while the second psychologist would, would do the diagnostic interview with the parents. Okay, for an adult, and an accompanying family member or a friend is can usually be requested. And again, I, I, I'm only speaking 
from my personal experience and the practice that I work in, we do always ask for somebody to come along. Again, as I said earlier on, it's not necessary. It's not going to exclude you from having an assessment. But it is, I found that it is very useful for, in, for a number of ways. It doesn't have to be a specific person. Per, we generally answer if a parent is available. Brilliant, because for the simple reason that they can fill in the early years, they, you know, there'd be gaps where you mightn't remember yourself or a parent or maybe an older sibling can fill out. But it can be anybody, it can be a, um, a partner, it can be a friend, but just somebody who knows you well. And the second reason why, um, I usually would kind of suggest this is that it's good to have somebody there as support. So somebody there who, who's going, you know, who's there for the interview, who's there to support you, who's going to support you afterwards, who's going to be there to, you know, to maybe fill in the gaps of the bit you might remember. I don't know anybody else out there, but I know even say a doctor's appointment, it's nice to have somebody, I like to have somebody with me that can, you know, fill in the gaps of the bits I didn't, I forgot or I missed. So so for those two reasons, so for filling in the gaps in terms of maybe the early years, for you know, a, a different perspective and for support for, for the person being itself. Because it's quite a long process. You know, it could be there for two, three hours and the whole focus is on, you know, it's on your life and it, it, can, it can be a difficult, difficult process to, to sit through on your own. So, but it's so if possible to have somebody with you, but it's not, it's not a requirement. So the diagnostic interview itself can be guided by a variety of different tools. So a couple of those examples of a couple of those are the autism diagnostic interview revised. So the ADIR, the childhood autism rating scale, uh, the Asperger syndrome diagnostic interview, and then the, uh, the overall diagnostic criteria from the DSM-5. So the, the person, the clinician doing, doing the interview would be using one or two of those tools as a guide to the diagnostic interview. Okay, so, so the final piece, just in terms of after the diagnostic interview, I mentioned earlier on that the final piece would be the report. So for most people, as I said, the, the key piece is confirmation of the diagnosis if it's there, and then some recommendations. So that is the most important piece is that you, you do get something afterwards that you can, you know, can your piece of paper to, to, to confirm or to um, exclude the diagnosis and to also include a variety of um, recommendations that are specific to you and to, to um, what you have described, the difficulties you might have or the and, and also the strengths that you have that you can really make use of throughout the, the diagnosis. Sorry, since I'm only reminding you two minutes to go. Oh my God. Okay, thanks, Rachel. <laughs> Sorry, everybody, I thought I had more time. So I just want to quickly have a look at the female presentation. So um, the NICE guidelines do suggest that autism in girls have, may be underdiagnosed, and a lot of the time it's to do with, say, say, masking and are leading to later on diagnosis. So say when demand outweighs ability, and it's quite common for uh, maybe in the teenage years when, you know, the structure of, say, primary school School is gone and there's more more and um, say making friends is, is more down to the individual etc so um, so in demand outweighs ability it can, it can that can happen at any age because there's a couple of points say secondary school or into college or or in adulthood or as Jodie mentioned earlier on when you have your own children okay so in female presentation the um social and in terms of social and communication Masking comes up a lot. So, you know, being able to watch others, being able to create, a, um, a, a, be able to imitate and mask. But what ultimately can happen here is that, and a little bit like what I was saying earlier on about the, the teachers maybe saying, you know, they didn't notice girls. So what can happen is the pressure and the frustration, the pressure of um, masking all day can mean that you're managing outside in the public environments, etc., and then at home can be meltdowns and and come, become really, really overwhelming. Um, you are going to get these slides, so you can have a read through this yourself. And I just want to flick onto the the other side, the re restrictive routines and behaviours. So in, in a lot of cases, a little bit like what um, uh, Jody mentioned early on, in a lot of the time, female female interests can be very socially acceptable. 
and the research uh, shows that some of the restricted or repetitive patterns can be more typical and same age. So say, for example, a girl may be into the same bands as her peers, but may just be that little bit extra, might know every single thing there is to know, and the interest might go on a little bit longer after her peers may maybe have moved on. Um, just want to have quickly have a look at this spectrum within the spectrum and just remind people that it's not a linear process. So it's not where you are on the spectrum or where somebody is in the spectrum. And just to have a look at this, the Mighty Wheel article by Neera Burt. So if anybody wants to have a look at that, it's a really lovely article that looks at how the individual wheel of presentation for each individual person. And I'm just going to quickly finish off with Marisa and tell me just, and I'm sure loads of you have already see, seen this quote, but just to, you know, for yourself and your, your clinician, just to remember if you meet one person with autism, you've met one person with autism. So that's just emphasizing the individuality. Thank you for listening. <laughs> thank you so much. That's great. And um, thank you for that very comprehensive uh, talk. And uh, we we'll look forward to um, you joining our panel at the end. And I just wanted to say, I, I, we noticed that there was a few people raising their hands in the presentation. And unfortunately, we're not able to take questions now. But if you could please put your questions through the questions and answer button, we will try and get to as many as we can. Uh, when we come to the discussion part. So thank you very much for that. And Louise uh, received a diagnosis of autism as a child and since then has occasionally talked about her experiences as an autistic person in public, most notably in Dublin Castle in 2016, and hopes to do more of that in the future. And she's currently studying history and political science at Trinity College Dublin and also enjoys photography and fiction in all forms. And her talk is going to cover her experience of being diagnosed during childhood and the effect that getting a diagnosis during childhood has had on her as she has grown up and gone through life, including the effects it has had on her access to help and supports, as well as her self-esteem. So thank you very much. Um, yeah, hi, I'm Louise. First of all, thank you for having me on to speak. The speech has been really brilliant tonight so far. So yeah, tonight I'm going to talk about my experience of receiving an autism diagnosis at a young age and how that's affected me. So for a girl my age, you know, growing up in the late 2000s, I was actually diagnosed early enough, like at the age of 10. This came after several years of assessment, so it did take a while. Overall, I'd say this diagnosis was a very positive thing for me, but it took me a long time to realize that. So when I read or even hear about adults getting their diagnosis, I've noticed that for them, the diagnosis tends to be an end to a journey. So they get their diagnosis and everything about them and their lives makes sense and they can begin loving themselves and learning the various skills they need to navigate the world on their own terms. But when you're younger, getting a diagnosis is not the end of a journey because when you're diagnosed at a young age, there's different effects because you haven't had the same amount of life experience. So when my parents sat me down to tell me that I was autistic, I didn't feel relieved. Instead, I burst into tears because my limited understanding of disability that I picked up from the media and from society was overwhelmingly negative and all they could think of was that this was a bad thing. So when adults get diagnosed they tend to have put a lot of thought into it and heavily researched it. They know what's coming, they know all about autism. So they know plenty about it and from reading those different accounts and hearing all those voices they realise that there is nothing to be ashamed of and that being autistic is not a negative thing. So at that time, I did not have those autistic voices in my life. And though I had a lot of support from my parents, I didn't have ac actually autistic voices around me giving me the message that it wasn't a shameful thing and that everything would be okay. So it really wasn't a moment of relief where my whole life suddenly made sense. Instead, it felt like I had a secret looming over me. And as I grew older, 
and struggle to make friends and cope with school, those negative feelings only intensify to the point where I saw it as something that was holding me back from fully living my life, where I saw autism as an it that was separate from me because I thought being autistic could only ever be negative. The process of loving and accepting myself came years after my diagnosis, rather than my diagnosis being the starting point. The benefits of the diagnosis ended up becoming apparent years later, as what the diagnosis did was lay the foundation for later growth and acceptance. So because my diagnosis came so early, the whole loving and accepting myself part came with making autistic friends who not only genuinely cared about me and understood me, but who also introduced me to autistic spaces online where autistic people of all different ages and backgrounds discussed about what it's like to be autistic and more importantly, why they're often happy and okay with being autistic. But it, that does not mean that my diagnosis was not important. The role that my diagnosis ended up playing was that it gave me access to the help and support that I really badly needed at the age of 10. When the time came and I met the people those people I truly clicked with. Thanks to the supports and help that I had had, I had the tools that I needed to be able to connect with them and make proper friendships. You see, as a child, a diagnosis tends to have the most benefits in terms of supports, as opposed to immediately helping with self-acceptance. So getting a diagnosis allowed my parents to access a range of supports to my behalf, such as a psychologist, psychologist who I still see regularly as well as a drama class designed to help with social skills and occupational therapy. So I'm really glad I was able to access these supports as they have all helped me so much. Because of my young age I can't actually give a lot of information on how the diagnosis process works because my parents just did it all. But what I will say is how they handled it made all the difference to me. So they always fought for my needs with teachers and professionals. And they are also very open about it rather than hiding it all away from me. I've heard that many parents simply don't tell their child about their diagnosis. And from my experience, I think this is an incredibly bad idea. So what I'd say if you're a parent, you're like, should I tell my child? I'd say no don't hide the diagnosis from your child. Obviously, parents should wait for an appropriate time to tell their children. Mine told me during my summer holidays when I didn't have school to stress about as well. But yeah, parents should tell their child about it eventually. Hide, by hiding it, nothing's achieved. And maybe you don't mean it by hiding it. And I really hope parents don't mean this. But by hiding it, it can give off the implicit message that a disability is a shameful thing that needs to be hidden. And I'm really grateful that my parents were open about it with me because they showed me that they weren't ashamed of me or loved me any less because of my disability. And during those years that I struggled with loving myself, their support was essential, as well as their acceptance of my diagnosis and willingness to access and engage with supports on my behalf. So yeah, access to the help that I needed ultimately gave me the tools to accept myself and to navigate my life more easily. I often think about the fact that I'd be a very different person today had I not gotten those supports that the diagnosis essentially was a key to. So to that effect, I must acknowledge that privilege played a part in this process of getting diagnosed because we live in a very unequal world where the wealth is controlled by a small amount of people and a lot of services in the past 40 years or so have been privatised, including health. And this has a knock-on effect on access to supports for autistic people. So obviously, we are lucky to have a public health system that offers autism diagnosis and services. It's a flawed system, notably with very long waiting lists. My parents could afford to go the private route for getting me diagnosed and later on for further help after a frustrating experience with the HSE. This is something that many cannot afford to do. 
It seems that parents are either faced with a long wait with the HSE or expensive prices should they go the private route. I also know that adults cannot get a diagnosis through public services, making diagnosis even less accessible the older you get. When I think of how much I struggled as a child and how much, my di- how much support my diagnosis led me to access, I become acutely aware of others in the same position that I was whose parents cannot afford to skip those long waiting lists to get their child the help they need. So, and I'm aware of how lucky that I am that my life could have been so different had my parents not had that money. And I always find it that it's incredibly unfair that we live in such a society, like in a country where this is the case, where access to services is essentially based on wealth. I hope that one day we live in a country where money is not a factor in how quickly you can access services, that the quality of life for autistic people is not decided by their parents' financial means. Ultimately, getting a diagnosis was good for me, even though it took me many years to realise that. I want to say it did not solve all my problems. I did not magically love myself or just instantly learn all the skills that I needed to navigate life. There was a lot that I had to do for myself once I engaged with these services. But a diagnosis is a starting point. It's a tool that's let me live my life to the fullest. It was the start of my journey, so to speak, to being able to cope with and navigate the world and to loving myself. So sorry if that speech was a bit short. Thank you again for having me on. Thank you. I don't think that speech was short. I think that was perfect. And and thank you very much, um, Louise. I think you really highlighted the importance of having access to supports and the importance of having autistic voices in our lives. So um, I'm really looking forward to you being involved in our panel later. We can just take a, a little break now if that's okay. And we'll see you then. Thank you. I'm very uh, pleased to welcome you all back now. And hopefully you had enough time to grab yourselves a cup of tea or a snack. And I'm very happy to introduce our next uh, contributors, who are my colleagues here in Lucina Clinic, Ashling McKenna and Neve Doody. So um, Ashling is in her final year of a professional doctorate in clinical psychology in Trinity College, Dublin. And before this, she spent two years at the National Centre for High Functioning Autism at Great Ormond Street Children's Hospital. And she has a special interest in the assessment um, um, of autism and especially in um, teenage girls and also the co-occurrence of some mental health uh, diagnosis like anxiety and anorexia and selective mutism. And Neve is a clinical psychologist in training with the University of Limerick, and she completed her undergraduate training in psychology in Maynooth and her master's degree in clinical neurodevelopmental sciences at the Institute of Psychiatry, Psychology and Neuroscience in King's College, London. And she is experienced of working in a specialist neurodevelopmental assessment service for adults in London as well as a research assistant in a European aut- the, the Longitudinal European Autism Project. And Ashley and Eve are going to be speaking about their experiences of working in different specialist autism services in the UK. And they're going to talk about what they learned from this experience, including the backgrounds of these services and what they provide for service users, professionals and researchers. And there's going to be a, a short little gap between the two presentations, just so that you're aware. So I, I let you go ahead and and um, let that run. Hi, my name's Ashling and I'm a psychologist in clinical training. And today I'm going to briefly talk about my experience of working in the specialist service in the UK. So I worked at the National Centre for High Functioning Autism at Great Ormond Street Hospital. And this was a national service that offered second opinion autism assessments and consultations to local teams across the UK and was open to referrals for under 18 to a mainstream education. And it worked really closely with the research team at UCL to help facilitate research to improve the evidence base for autism and assessment of autism. So how do these specialist services work in the UK? 
So usually when there's concerns around a young person and autism, a GP will facilitate a referral to a local service to assess for autism. However, one to two percent of these cases that are assessed locally may then require a further specialist autism opinion. So what type of cases might these be? So it might be that there's a difference of opinion between clinicians or between clinicians and parents. It might be that some of the behaviours and difficulties that are evident at home are then not evident in clinic. And it can be really difficult to tease apart what's going on for the young person and a lack of clarity around diagnosis. Then it comes to differential diagnosis. So it can be really difficult when a child and young person is presenting with a mental health difficulty. And there's a query whether there's an underlying neurodevelopmental cause or difficulty associated with that. So we know 70% of autistic people have a mental health condition and 40% have two or more. So it can be really difficult to tease these things apart and to work out what's going on for this young person. There can be mental health conditions and difficulties that present similar to autism, such as attachment difficulties, selective mutism, anxiety. So it can be really helpful to have a thorough specialist assessment looking at these things. And these specialist assessments, uh, specialist services, have been set up as they improve the health outcomes of children and young people. If they can get access to a specialist assessment and diagnosis, then that can be the gateway to access the correct local services closer to home. So here's just a snapshot of the type of referrals that we are receive in. So 45% of our referrals were for girls. The mean age at referral was 12 years old. So typically at the age for the child would transition to secondary school. So these children can be really well supported in primary school. And then when they transition to secondary school, the difficulties can become more apparent. So there's an increase in the need for the child to be more independent and also social interactions become more complex and demanding. So this is when the difficulties can become more apparent. And a large proportion of referrals were coming from mental health services. So these young people are already presenting with mental health difficulties. So then moving on to the assessment. So parents in school will be sent out questionnaires and screening tools to assess for autism, mental health difficulties, um, learning difficulties, just to establish what may be going on for this child and to help guide the assessment. And um, parents will then be invited in for a 3DI, which is a um, really in-depth diagnostic uh, developmental interview, which is computer-based. And then the child would be invited in for an ADOS to look at their social communication, a cognitive to look at their learning, and also more often than not, a school observation. So to see this child in a more natural environment than the clinic, to see them during structured periods, such as classes, unstructured periods, so between classes, moving between classrooms or break time, and also seeing how they interact with their peers. And usually have a school meeting at this point to find out a bit more from school what may be going on for this young person. Following this assessment, there'd be feedback um, for the parents and feedback to local services and advice given around what would best suit this young person um, and what services they should be accessing. And then also there'd be a school consultation. So providing individual advice around this young person to really help them thrive in the school environment. So this leads on to the difficulties then that we saw in assessing girls. So we know boys are four times more likely to receive a diagnosis of autism than girls. And because of this, research historically has focused on understanding autistic males. So it's been very biased. This is evolving now, but the standardized tools that we use for assessing autism have yet to catch up. So there's an inherent gender bias in the tools that we're using during assessment. So we know girls are less likely to come to the attention of services and to be diagnosed unless they have additional difficulties. So that could be intellectual difficulties or mental health difficulties. We know as well that girls are more likely to be diagnosed later than boys, which means that they may have learned to cope in social situations 
through mimicking and masking their difficulties, which then can be difficult when it comes to assessing and trying to understand what may be going on. So these are the four main areas of difference between autistic girls and autistic boys. And this comes from clinical practice and from research. So really thinking about how can we correct this gender bias in the tools. So we know social motivation, that autistic girls are more socially motivated and more likely to put more effort into establishing friendships. However, they may have high levels of um, conflict within these friendships, but they're more socially motivated than autistic boys. When it comes to restricted and repetitive interests, so girls are more likely to have strong interests that are in um, that are relational, that are involved in developing relationship with others. So these may be these others may be celebrities or pop stars or animals which are not uncommon interests for a teenage girl. However, the narrowness and intensity of these interests can be unusual. When it comes to repetitive and stereotype behaviors, such as hand flapping and spinning. So girls are much more likely to camouflage these difficulties. So in order to fit in and to not risk social isolation, they learn to mimic or to mask these behaviors. So you're less likely to exhibit to see these behaviours. And then girls are much more likely than boys to experience internalising difficulties. So that's anxiety and depression, whereas autistic boys are more likely to experience externalising difficulties, such as behavioural difficulties. Thank you very much for listening. And I'll pass you over now to Neve, who's going to talk from the adult perspective. Hello, my name is Neve Doody and I'm a clinical psychologist in training at the University of Limerick. Like Ashley, I've gained both clinical and research experience in the UK and my brief talk will cover some of the reasons that someone may seek an autism assessment as an adult, some of the more common presentations in women seeking an autism assessment, some of the challenges that clinicians can face when assessing for autism, as well as addressing some of the reasons why there may be a delay in assessment and diagnosis. So for some people, the function of an autism assessment is to seek diagnostic clarity, whether that be to gain a second opinion or to have other diagnoses re-examined. Re for others, coming into contact with the criminal justice system may be, um, may be what prompts them to seek an assessment. Knowing that someone is autistic can have considerable implications for their sentencing and may impact on where they may be placed um, and what type of facility that they may be placed in. For other people, it may be the experience of having a child or a family member receive a diagnosis that prompts them to undergo their own assessment. For autistic women, um, it's common to hear um, experiences of burnout, particularly um, following social interaction or engaging in social activities, um, feeling um, also feelings of being different, um, different to peers, different to um, family members as well, which can be um, a reason for seeking an assessment. And for some other people, it can be difficulty in forming and or maintaining romantic relationships. So there are many reasons why there might be a delay in seeking an assessment. In fact, some of our speakers have touched on this in their talks. Firstly, it is important to note that our collective understanding of what autism is has changed considerably over time. As a result, the criteria to meet the diagnostic threshold has also changed and continues to expand. Both on an individual and societal level, we are becoming more aware of what autism is. However, there's still certain stereotypes that are presented and perpetuated in the media, which can be unhelpful and damaging. Changes to diagnostic criteria and increased awareness have um, helped us to identify autism better. Um, however, there has been a lost generation of autistic individuals whose autism um, remains unidentified or detected. 
With respect to autistic women, there is evidence to show that women are more likely to internalize their difficulties and in turn, it may take them longer for them to be identified as autistic. As clinicians, our role is to identify autistic traits, characteristics and behaviours across the lifespan. So um, it's important to get a very detailed early developmental history. Um, however, in adult services, that's not always possible um, and that can be a challenge for us. For many people seeking an autism assessment, they may also have other co-occurring conditions and it's very important to have a, a team of cl skilled clinicians um, involved in the assessment of autism um, to definitely um, identify um, autistic traits if they are present. Also for many um, autistic people, they have, they have um, formed adaptive strategies and this can be referred to as camouflaging or masking of core autistic traits and therefore clinicians, for clinicians it's really important to recognise and understand um, these strategies as they can, um, as it'll help inform our assessment. So I've briefly covered quite a lot in that talk and if anyone would like to ask any more specific questions please feel free to do so. Thank you. Thank you very much that was a very interesting um, and helpful presentation and I know that we I'm sure we have lots of questions for Ashley and Neve as well um, and I just wanted to move on then to our next speaker. Our next presenter is um, Una Sheehan and Una is a retired national tour guide um, who's always been fascinated by the past and has degrees in archaeology and history of art from UCD and qualifications and experience in journalism and teaching and further education in the UK and she's lived abroad in Rome and London and she um, heard about a young child being diagnosed with autism and re basically read a book about it and began getting some of the answers that she was looking for and this culminated in a diagnosis of um, autism at age 70 and she she said that um, there's a great bonus to being part of um, the autism community in Ireland meeting up with people of like mind and real expertise at a time when we are valued and respected at last and so the presentation outlines her reasons for seeking assessment at, um, as well as her responses to the result and to the wider context of the autism community um, and research now and why this has been a positive experience for her. So I'm very happy to hand over to Una now. Hello, this is Una here. My name is Una. I'm age 70 and I'm here to talk to you today about adult uh, assessment of autism in women um, in later life. I was diagnosed two years ago at the age of 70 uh, after looking for a certain number of two years. Why, you might well wonder, at my age, would I want to be assessed? Well, I had three main reasons. First of all, it's personal. It's the ultimate personal question is if you're autistic or not. Secondly, I want to do a proper test. It's one thing to test online and a few uh, tests. It's quite another to do, um, to actually manage to get a full proper gold standard assessment. So I thought if I'm, if I'm autistic and I fulfill the conditions, I really want to know. And thirdly, um, for security, to know what my rights were under the constitution in Ireland here as an Irish citizen living in Ireland right now. So th these were my main reasons for um, going for an assessment um, at my age. Um, first of all, it's a personal story. Um, I first heard about autism four years ago. Someone told me a story about a young woman I knew whose son had just be ass been assessed. I thought I knew nothing about autism at all. So I went and I got a book about it and lo and behold on page 18, 19 in a list of symptoms about you know, social interactions and communication and behaviours and so on. I suddenly got a glimpse of something I recognised in myself. So I went to the back of the book and got 
uh, online onto the AQ test immediately, the autism quotient test um, devised by the Cambridge, um, the Autism Research Centre in Cambridge by Professor Baron Cohen, among others. And I carefully took the test very carefully. But even so, I was right over the line. Uh, I scored right away um, the diagnostic level of 37. So I thought, right, I'll pursue this further. And um, I joined the Channel 4 TV programme uh, on how to stick are you and took the test, the sample. There were seven, over 700,000 people, I think, who took the test that day. And uh, I was one of the eight, over 80,000 that scored again, you know, diagnostic level, another red flag. So I thought, right, I will look for a proper assessment. But it was actually, I was told it was difficult, expensive, rare, especially at my age, nobody would bother. And so I anyway, I pursued it. And to my, I was very lucky that Trinity uh, they, uh, had a conference uh, in February um, last year in 2019. And um, I applied to go on that, pointing out that um, even if they were doing research on lots of young people, I actually had no time to waste. I really wanted to know right now. Fortunately, very fortunately, they finally agreed with me and I got into the room and attended that day where the research results were being shared, um, both with researchers and people there who were actually autistic. So um, that's where I first heard the expression. Someone used the phrase autistic community. And I asked the person, I said, I mean, is that just a figure of speech or, you know, is there an actual organized community anywhere? Is there any coordination about it? And she linked me into that. And for that, I should be ever grateful to her for doing that. And um, going to a meetup, you know, with with uh, people in the autistic community, um, I found my way to diagnosis uh, in a safe pair of hands and pulling all my um, courage together, I presented myself uh, in April 2019 to be uh, to be assessed. And uh, after a structured interview with my results from RADS and the, the AQ test and um, going for a couple of hours, going through really quite a lot of things, my story, my education, my background, my you know career, um, my situation now, I'm retired. Um, finally, the psychologist uh, waved at me and, and said, you know, you've, you've crossed the line. You, you definitely are autistic. There's no doubt about it. And I said, well, right, I would like a report about that because I really want to know my legal rights and um, a report that shows that I've reached the forensic uh, test of autism. I would really like that, you know, and that was provided. Um, and I use that as a basis to apply for and get the um, autism ID card. This is uh, done by at a European level by the um, and provided by the uh, As I Am Autism Charity um, and my lanyard. Um, and um, that uh, I, I bring around with me to as my sort of security blanket, in a way, my green card, I call it. Um, and they used the research, they read the report as, you know, a guarantee that this wasn't a figment of the imagination, um, that I was indeed autistic. So, um, um, so I found that of the three reasons that I looked for, the personal issue, the... Um, the personal issue, the uh, test, you know, this was a proper uh, test by a psychologist who recognised autism and knew what it was about, especially in women. Um, and um, here I got my result. Um, so um, the it's not as if I hadn't encountered difficulties before. I had depression in my teens, anxiety in my early 20s, to the point where you know, I actually had a breakthrough at 24 uh, and a psychiatrist said, there, there, things have clearly got on your nerves. And uh, another years later said to me, you know, you may be no mother's dream, Una, but you're, you're certainly not crazy. Get out of here. Um, and a kind therapist talked over many issues with me and I'm very grateful for his help. And a Jungian analyst who um, helped me write the dictionary of um, Jungian terms of uh, on on uh, used in analysis Jungian analysis um, around schizophrenia and so on. She got me to read the book about um, where 
this issue is really discussed here. Yeah, symbols of transformation where Jung says you know these symbols that you see in uh, dreams and so on are actually full of meaning and that really struck a chord with me because my special interest which I have degrees in and stuff is uh, art history and archaeology and I'm very interested in heritage and cultural artifacts and so on um, as well as publishing and um, teaching I actually earned my living as a guide for 10 years explaining all this stuff um, to visitors to Ireland so um, the now I had a report that I could produce, but I also wanted to know exactly, you know, what my rights were. And um, I found under the Irish Constitution, a copy of which I keep here by the door to protect me. Um, I found that when my parents passed away 21 years ago, it was a moment of great insecurity for me. And so I went and found um, independent legal advice. Um, and I found that the uh, the legislation in place at the time, the Succession Act, um, was still the background there uh, was the old Lunacy Act, which is now fortunately being struck out two years ago, signed out of law by um, Michael D. Higgins, our, our president. And uh, But the new Capacity Act has not yet fully been enacted and there is still stuff to be worked out there that had made it not a fully complete completed work so that's still a work in progress um but uh the un convention uh, on uh, people uh, for protecting people with um disabilities has been signed up to by the government so i feel there's a measure of protection in that and um things like the uh, course of control uh, legislation has come in so I feel a much greater level of protection um, now than I did uh, 21 years ago. So um, that was quite successful. And the big silver lining for me actually has been the autistic community, because um, from the time I first encountered them just under two years ago, um, I found lots of people of like mind who are interesting. And um, this year, particularly, I've participated in um, in webinars and so on. And I've just found it absolutely fascinating and helpful. So to me, it's been a whole new world and a very interesting one. And in fact, uh, Simon Baron Cohen's new book on the pattern seekers and new theory of invention, I find very satisfactory because my the way I approached this was if if this autism was a personal story for me and by being properly tested, uh, then I could find a measure of security now that I lacked before. Um, and it's been a, a fantastic experience for me. Um, and I would encourage anybody, even at my age, uh, to have that, you know, ontological security and legal security as to my actual position and the level of care and support I actually need, which I had valiantly ignored all my life, saying, no, I'm an, very much an independent, autonomous person. I don't need any help from anybody. But um, uh, a psychiatrist once pointed out to me, you know, medicine treats what it can, bracket inference, you know, it can't cure autism. But actually, you need to take care. Um, and the kinds of cares and support that are now available um, are so much better than they were years ago. And I'm very pleased to see in the news today that the special needs schools will be open again next week um, because I've seen mothers, you know, on TV really being quite burdened um, and very much needing support. So I would even say at my age, you know, actually, I'm very glad of support and the solidarity of the autistic community of which I am now a card carrying member. Um, because life, after all, is a marathon event. And in fact, I did um, get a marathon medal uh, a number of years ago. I did complete the marathon. Uh, it was only a mini marathon, I might add, um, and walking in a very funny walk at that. But um, on the marathon event that is this world, you would need to be properly prepared for and to know and make the most of this gift because Years ago, this was only sort of treated as pathology uh, the worst possible way and dismissed. Um, but now it's actually something that's valued and sought out um, because the focus and autonomy and choice and diversity and invention and discovery 
um, that people on the autism spectrum bring to um, their activities has a very big upside. It's actually a golden shadow um, and it's now being appreciated. I was interested to see in a recent webinar by my old alma mater, UCD, in cooperation with Stanford University, somebody let the cat out of the bag and said, well, you know, the investment bank JP, Ch uh, JP Morgan has found that people on the spectrum are between 45 and 145 percent more productive than all our other employees on first strike um, tasks, getting things right first time, which would be, you know, a very big asset, seeing that 85 percent uh, of people on the spectrum don't find suitable employment because of the difficulties in social interaction and communication uh, and the behaviours which, you know, other people often find annoying. Um, so, you know, that's a very big plus now and I'm very glad to have survived to see the day I got very good care um, and protection and security. I'm only, every day I live, I only realise how protected um, and secure I uh, I was in the way I was brought up and it turns out that my parents knew from the get-go and in fact my dad mentioned Asperger's to me a few years before he died um, and I dismissed it I said oh dad don't be silly you know but actually he was right his diagnosis was correct um, and mum was super protective um, so I'm very glad and grateful to those who got me here safe and sound ish um, and uh, the friends and neighbours and um, allies um, I have found um, along the way that have really helped me get here. So I'm uh, very glad to have been assessed even at my age and I found it enormous plus I'm having the time of my life and I hope that anyone else that uh, searches for proper assessment delivered by a psychologist at my age was a very big bonus and um, I'm having the time of my life and I would wish everyone uh, well that is in this situation. I'm glad to be contributing today, today to the Psychological Society of Ireland, the John of Gods and the Autism Community of Ireland and also TCD who opened the door to me to be assessed properly. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Una. That was really informative and really uh, positive, actually. And I'm, I'm really annoyed that we have such short amounts of time to, to let all your presentations go on for, because we could listen all night, I suppose. Um, so annoyingly, we can't. Um, but I wanted to move on now to our final presenter, who is Elaine McGreevy. And Elaine is a speech and language therapist with 25 years of experience. And she's based in Northern Ireland and works in the NHS and an independent practice. And she has worked as a lead clinician since 2001 in setting up and developing diagnostic and speech and language therapy services for autistic children and young people. And she uh, applies a pro neurodiversity framework in her clinical work, ensuring that neurodivergent children are supported using a strengths based positive approach. And her contribution to autism speech and language therapy services were recognized with the autism um, Northern Ireland Laura Millen Award in 2011 and she and her early years colleagues at Glenbrook um, Short Start in Belfast uh, won the National Autistic Society Professional Award in the early years and education category for inspirational education provision in primary schools and early years in 2019. Uh, so in this brief presentation um, Elaine is going to talk about the impact of gender and autism stereotyping and how it contributes to misdiagnosis, possible misdiagnosis and stigma. And um, she's also going to be um, discussing factors influencing the diagnostic process. Um, and the presentation finishes with the implications for supporting autistic people. So I'll hand you over to Elaine. OK, I think that's on. So thanks, uh, Maria. So. Yes, this is me, Elaine McGreevy, just giving you um, hopefully only 15 minutes of some brief thoughts around uh, the gendering of autism and um, possibly just some kind of thoughts to expand uh, just beyond stereotyping. And uh, I'm not going to go into detail here, but um, obviously the most recent uh, um, prevalence is a three to one uh, ratio of, of males to females. Um, in the UK, and that's the same in Northern Ireland. Indeed, one in 24 uh, children, school children in Northern Ireland um, are autistic. 
and three to one ratio. So my, my, in my, all of my years of working as a speech and language therapist in this area, I suppose I meet the parents of autistic children. I read and listen and talk to autistic people all the time. And these are the things that echo for me that um, so many people have been not identified as autistic and they have you know, been mislabeled. I mean, the amount of young children that I have come across who might have been mislabeled as, you know, obstinate, um, oppositional defiant disorder, um, and borderline personality disorder is another one that uh, young uh, women seem to get. And uh, there are um, a great website to link into is Neuroclastic and there's a great blog on there about someone who got a, a range of diagnosis. I, ADHD, anxiety, depression, borderline personality disorder, gender identity disorder, OCD, a lot of disorders there actually, but actually all those labels would fall away when th this person was given an autistic identity. And that's what really matters. Um, as Una said, at, eight, at 70 years old, it doesn't matter, but it, do it really does matter because who you are, you know, so I do, I do worry sometimes that in society we have this confirmation bias, which says that we all as society know what autistic people look like. We have an idea of what autistic women look like. We have an idea of what autistic boys look like. But in some ways, then that's just what we're looking for. And then when we see that stereotype, that confirms our bias and we go, yes, you're autistic and you're not. And then I think that's where we have some challenges around, it. it takes a long time for somebody to arrive at that identity and that um, authentic diagnosis that makes sense to who they are. And of course, I am conscious of the transgender and the gender diverse uh, community who, who may be non-binary, um, who are trans, male, trans, female, and where do they fit when we use these particular male and female um, kind of uh, stereotypes. So I think it, the challenge to us always is to look broad and stay open-minded. And it really, it's, it's not our fault because uh, we've been educated by the researchers who were very biased as um, was referenced in the previous research about the gender bias in research. And obviously Simon Baron Cohen, you know, his extreme male brain theory, you know, theorizing that autistic people were autistic because they had more male hormones. And so they, that they were less likely to have empathy um, more likely to have a systemizing brain. So we, so that has stayed in our echoes of how we think about autistic people. And in some way it creates that, that bias when we're looking at, um, at um, the people that we meet in diagnostic clinics or in our lives. And then of course, you know, but because people were recognizing that this was a difficulty, then, you know, there has been a great effort to try to redress that balance. So obviously the research that has been done on female autism, you know, suggesting there is a protective element. So that's why autistic women are not identified or don't get, don't, aren't autistic. That's not been proven. Um, the female autism phenotype. So really this description of um, the classic, female presentation that is that person is very likely to be a masking uh, person uh, very able to socially manage a lot of situations with while internally laboring really hard over that whole interaction and the excessive thinking about am I doing the right thing here and there so so I suppose we we do recognize that profile but of course um, what uh, I just want my thing is what about the non-binary? What about the trans people that you know when they don't fit those particular labels, um, those stereotypes? Where do they fit? And does that have a stigmatizing effect for them? It does that have an exclusion? Are we excluding them then in the conversation and the narrative about what it is to be um, autistic? What is um, autistic lived experience? So um, great research, I should really recommend you to search it out in um, Amy Pearson and Kieran Rose and um, the conceptual analysis of masking. 
So it's a super paper. It's just been released and I've got a few quotes in there. And Karen Rose probably for me is the is one of the leading voices in understanding masking. So you know, and I suppose what he says is that, you know, uh, partly this idea of what you think an autistic boy is, and then an autistic girl, that so the, the autistic girl is doing more of the stereotyped things that we expect of women in our society. So that's really, again, our confirmation bias that is saying, well, if she if she lines up her teddies on her bed, sure, that's very cute. That's very nice and cuddly. That's not anything. Whereas the little guy, if he knows all the dinosaurs and he can line them all up, that's totally autistic. You know, so I think, you know, our challenge is to kind of throw some of that stereotyping out, you know. This is a really good um, quote from the um, an anonymous contributor in the Neurodiversity Reader, which is a great book published last year with Damien Milton as one of the lead editors. But obviously this uh, lady, it was a woman who basically said, you know, if we're not obviously on the spectrum, just like Temple Grandin, we're not pegged as having the disorder at all. And opposite to our opposite gender peers, our autistic diagnosis is a personality flaw that we're responsible for. So we get blamed and we get gaslit for, you know, being too sensitive or being too rude. You know, we're using the wrong tone. And so any understanding of sarcasm, nuance or humor in general becomes evidence that we're faking it. You know, she can't be autistic because she has a sense of humor. She can't be autistic because she's, she makes eye contact. She can't be autistic because she's got great empathy. And actually that's really the confirmation bias that we need to throw out. We need to understand that the truth about autistic people is they are just as diverse as anyone else. And yes, of course, they can make eye contact in trusting relationships or if they've actually learned to mask that skill. And yes, of course, autistic people have empathy, absolutely buckets to the point that it can hurt. Um, so factors affecting identification. So yes, the gender bias. So basically, I think this is a great statement within that piece of research I was just reading. Judging how autistic a person appears to be is how well they're to perform on non-autistic um, behaviors you know so I sort of as a diagnostician I have a I have increasingly got a great dissatisfaction with working in the medical model where you have to describe someone with deficits in order to identify them as autistic you have to measure them against a neuronormative standards to say they're all autistic so I feel the process in itself, while it can be very positive and validating, and certainly if it's, if it's me working with any family, I do it in a positive strength-based way. But ultimately, I'm comparing this person to a set of criteria that says they have deficits. And I think we have a long way to go before, well, I think we should change it, but I'm not in charge of changing all of these criteria. But I think we should think hard about it because um, Louise referenced stigma earlier in her talk and um, Jody talked about this pressure that she had to mask from an early age that she didn't know that was a pressure she felt that was a pressure inside but that is a society pressure that stigma that's on the outside and part of it is working in a medical model and part of it is the is the medical model language that we use and I think that there needs to be something around that I think I'm gone off on a tangent here because I um, because I sometimes I think, well, what we're in a diagnostic process, we are looking for such strong characteristics to say, yes, they clearly have these deficits. But what about the internalizing presentation of being autistic? What if you're sitting really still? What if you've learned to nod your head and agree and ask a few socially interested questions and you can um manage social interactions to a, a certain extent it doesn't mean you're not autistic it just means that assessment and the medical model framing and the gender bias criteria is not allowing us to really identify you and that for me is a real is a real problem that I have day to day and then I suppose sometimes when we ask our the parents tell us about your son or daughter or do they have things that they're passionate about and how passionate are they sometimes the parents may not know 
the extent of the child's interests or stims, for example, and they may not be able to give that. So it's not that you're not autistic, it just means that the information cannot be gathered at this time, has not been uncovered. And that's one of the reasons why it can take a longer time. And masking, I just wanted a few little points on that. A lot of people have talked about it. It is a key theme, but it, this is a really important, I think, leap forward in the understanding of masking from this recent research. So autistic masking is the conscious, but also unconscious suppression. So our, talk, our speakers talked about consciously acting and performing, but there is also an unconscious suppression of your natural responses and adoptions of alternatives like the neuro neuronormative behaviors um, across interactions. And that can happen early in life. And certainly Kieran Rose, the autistic advocate on Facebook, that's where his page is. Um, he has a website as well, but he would say, and in this research is called an anxiety, a trauma response. And it's rooted in early socialization and sensory differences. And the reason is for self-protection so that you don't be um, punished, victimized, bullied, joked at, sneered at. You know, you will then um, adopt these um, camouflaging behaviors. Um, and the fawning, you know, that uh, Jody mentioned that earlier, that unbelievable urge to please other people, which is another um, masking response and uh, can leave you in a vulnerable situation if you don't know yourself and you don't know that vulnerability um, and of course we know that the masking is related to poor outcomes for autistic people so all the very recent research about the mental health issues and the suicidality links with masking is correlated autistic burnout finally because autistic people have been talking about autistic burnout for the longest time but now we have a piece of research that actually describes that and all the factors that feed into that and as an autistic person, it's important to know that, that that could happen and know what it is, because then that's one of the things can be mislabeled when you're having a mental health assessment as well. I see I've probably a two minute warning coming up, so we're nearly finished anyway. So so I just want to urge us all um, as clinicians, as uh, just interested people to really go beyond stereotypes there is a great diversity in humanity you know no two human beings are the same and so everyone comes with their own a variety of learning ability attentional control and um, lived experience from life experiences that might have been traumatic and um, neurology uh, epilepsy um, whole dyspraxia uh, other conditions so you're that's your your neurology your psychology so that you're never going to get another person like you so autistic women have different experiences to autistic men for sure just like black people have different experiences to white autistic people just like trans women have different experiences to cis women so uh, how autism presents is influenced by all the same factors for all humans by your color, your race, your religion, your culture, your family experiences and your life events. So really for me, it's about when we meet a person who is thinking they might be autistic or their family thinks they might be autistic, it's to, yes, be aware of female presentations, male presentations, but actually just listen to the autistic person, tell their story, create that place for them to open up so, you know, most times I just let um, autistic people tell me their story and I can he hear and see their, their, their characteristics are different style, you know. So my last page, be curious and open minded to support autistic people. There is no right way to be a human being. Learn from autistic people, advocates and researchers and um, great examples of wonderful advocates here tonight who have educated us all. Just be aware of how autism stereotyping actually denies a person's need to be identified. You know, you should, you're too mild. You know, you make eye contact, you've got a friend. You don't need to have this diagnosis. Why do you need it? You need it because Una said it mattered. You know, keep up to date with contemporary research. So double empathy problem really recognizes that autistic people don't have empathy difficulties. In fact, there's a shared empathy difficulty between autistic and non-autistic people. Diversity and in social intelligence, recognizing that autistic social interaction is a valid social interaction. It's not deficient, not disordered. It's a valid way of interacting and communicating. 
monotropism, autistic people tend to process in a tunnel processing. So actually, if we could work to that strength, you know, um, Luke Bearden, who's at the University of Sheffield, he really advocates for in secondary schools, instead of pupils having 30 minute lessons, if somebody is autistic and they have a monotropic tunnel processing, they should be doing three hours of history instead of starting and stopping every 30 minutes. Um, reject social skills training for autistic children and adults because that is really damaging because if we know that masking is damaging, social skills training is actively reinforcing masking and that's damaging and there's nothing wrong with autistic social interaction, it's perfectly valid. And um, focus on a strengths-based model. Um, support the person to learn to be a self-advocate, know your own boundaries, express your own boundaries, express your needs and autonomy versus independence. So I know as a speech therapist working with children, that can be a big focus on he needs to be independent, he needs to be this. But I actually know from listening to autistic adults, sometimes they do need help from certain people at certain times to live the life they want to live, not compared to anybody else, but live a good autistic life. And that's being autonomous rather than independent and support for sensory needs. So that's me done. Thank you for listening. Stop thank, you. Sure. <laughs> thank you very much, Elaine. That's really helpful and really interesting. And I think listening to you and to the other contributors from tonight, the message that one of the messages that struck me is a quote, um, this above all to thine own self be true. Um, and I just I just wanted to thank you very much because I think the contributions this evening have been brilliant and I'm really looking forward to the panel discussion. But we're going to take a little five minute break before then. So we're going to hopefully see you back shortly. <laughs> Thank you. Now, I'm just wondering um, if our panelists could turn on their mics and cameras if you haven't already done so. And I am going to set a little bit of a timer on my phone, even though I'm sure we'll go over the time, <laughs> which is fine. And um, I want to welcome everybody back now and hopefully now we'll get a chance to delve a little bit deeper into some of the issues that were raised during our presentations and highlighted by our audience. And we've had a huge number of um, questions coming in, which is fantastic. And I think at the beginning we said we were going to try and see if we could uh, make sure that all the panelists can contribute. So I don't know whether you want me to direct the questions at anyone in particular or I mean I, I'm happy to go with that and then maybe you guys take over. <laughs> um, the first question that we have is um, how can we support a diagnosis process from a less pathologizing perspective so not calling it a disorder or a condition. So the attendees were wondering whether our clinicians and our experts by experience think that disorder is a fair label uh, in respect to autism. Um, so I just, I'm not sure who to, to direct that at. Maybe I could direct it at, you know, um, whoever wants to answer that one. I mean, I know Elaine, you had specifically talked a little bit about that in the last, yeah. the last um, bit of your talk. So if you wanted to start off, maybe. Yeah, I mean, it's time. I mean, the, the autistic people are, are always ahead of us and they're they're proudly owning autistic as their preferred um identity and i see nothing wrong with us following them and actually owning autistic as the is as, as the identity so disorder is medical model it's pathology paradigm and it's part of the stigma that uh, is part of the whole problem with um, for autistic people living in a in a world where they're not the dominant neurotype yet, so um, so I wish we could just do without disorder or condition, just be. So I have actually started to write my diagnostic reports, and at the end of it, I will say they have the characteristics um, consistent with being autistic, and I feel quite fine with that. I'm, I'm going to completely and utterly agree with Elaine and, and I actually find it very difficult to, you know, when when discussing with people, I, I totally agree. It, like, I hate the word disorder. I try my absolute utmost not to use it when I'm 
you know, you're meeting with people or just unfortunately it, in terms of support, say for children, maybe getting um, supports through school as in the official term. And I've had my reports come back a couple of times from say CNOs or anything saying, can you please write it the official way? So unfortunately it does have to go into some reports, you know, according to the DSM official term. And for that reason, it, it does go into my reports, but I would agree with Elaine, if I had the choice, I would be saying autistic and I wouldn't be using it. And hopefully down the line, we will be able to move to, to a position where it's not required. And um, Una, I saw you kind of, I think you, did you have something to say there as well? I do, because you, you've, you've got to acknowledge both sides, that there are strengths in it. And it's great to hear mm -hmm. that assessments are much more strength based. But you've also got to acknowledge that as far as the, the rest of the 99% or 98% of people are concerned, you know, they've got a problem with you. And a very interesting comment by a parent who's also a professional was, I thought, very good um, parent of an autistic child too, um, who said, you know, it's not all unicorns and rainbows, mm -hmm. you know. It's not all magic and sparklies and good stuff. You know, there's stuff that's very challenging. And if you have a, a kid that's quite strong willed and obstinate and really intent on doing the whole thing, there's a point where you've got to say that's all on fine and dandy. But the, the other 90 percent or 98 percent are going to have a problem with you. So you've got to acknowledge both the light and the shadow. They're both together and part of the condition. The shadows are part of the reason this was ignored for so long. Now they're focusing on the light, which is better, OK, because you can make more of the good stuff. But you've got to acknowledge them both. I personally think it should be autistic spectrum conditions. Uh, you know, I'd be with them on that. But of course, all, you know, DSM-5 and all the rest of it listed under paragraph 299 of DSM-V ASD. So bang, there it is. So I can say, look at the manual. I fulfill the criteria and I know that. And these are seen, I know that these are seen as a problem by society. I acknowledge their problem. OK, just as they're acknowledging mine, but also I have my strengths acknowledged now, just as we're all exposed, expected to, you know, go along with the rest of neurotypical society. So, you know, it's a kind of getting that balance right is, is really important. But you've got to you've got to show both sides of it. You know, you've got to acknowledge both sides of it, you know. That's so I'm you know, quite intent on that, but that, pair, you know, large round paired, it's not all unicorns and rainbows, you know, it really isn't. There are challenging, there are real challenges, especially over, over a lifetime. You get to have your nose rubbed in them all the time. I was in boarding school for six years. You know, some people thought it was lovely. I was told it was a privilege all the time. So I shut up and behaved myself, quote unquote, um, and um, went and hid, you know. Because to me, 24-7 social interaction was hell, absolute hell. So, but my sisters went to the same school and they absolutely loved it. No problem. Good for them. You know, nothing wrong with the school. It's just I was a misfit in that environment, you know, and therefore, it, you know, defined as a problem rather than somebody who can be accommodated. And I was eventually, the last two years, they gave up and accommodated me and that was brilliant. You know, it was fine. But, um, you know, there are problems. But I do wish it was listed under autism spectrum conditions. But as far as the rest of the society concerned, they are disorders, they are shortcomings, they are deficits, you know. So that's Obviously, my tuppence uh, worth, you know. Changing a bit, yeah, but I, I understand. Um, and I don't know if anybody else wanted to say any, any more comments on that. Louise, did you want to say anything or? Um, I don't know if I'm following the thread, but I think I, yeah, I think I'd agree in getting rid of the disorder, but it just reminds me of arguments within the whole disability positivity movement, because some people are like, oh, but you're not acknowledging the difficult stuff. And that's not the point of it. The point of it is, yes, to be loving and accepting of yourself, but also to advocate for support oh, yeah. to help with the more difficult bits. Yeah, oh, yeah. So, yeah. yeah exactly. And I know in some countries you won't get you won't get your health insurance if it's not if it's not named as a as a kind of a disorder even if yeah if the person doesn't want it to be labeled as a disorder you won't actually won't get any any supports if you need the support so there's all those things right. in America and stuff like exactly. that um, exactly. 
so uh, we might move on to the next question. So the next question says, um, how do you differentiate or distinguish when masking or mimicking is working so well that it might not be obvious in observations? Is there any tools or ratio scales that are helpful in this situation? For example, someone who masks very well at school or work, but is very different at home. So I don't know who might be, I, mean, I don't know, does um, Ashling or Neve or, um, Anybody else want to answer that one? <laughs> I can jump in there. Um, so there is a questionnaire, the Camouflaging Autistic Traits Questionnaire, um, that can be really helpful for, it's a self-report questionnaire. That can be helpful for seeing if there is camouflaging going on there. Also thinking about young people, it's really listening to parents so that we know that there could be behavior, nothing really seen at school um, and nothing really going on and children really holding it together until they get home, like other speakers have talked about, when they get home, then there's these meltdowns. So it's really listening to parents when they're coming in for assessment and maybe taking a bit of a step back when we're looking at the diagnostic criteria. So looking at the wider perspective of what may be going on. Um, yeah. Thank you, that's really helpful. Um, this is a question, um, I, I wondered if, if Jody, you might consider answering this one. It's saying, um, could I ask um, the pan a panelist to share a gold nugget piece of advice, if they could, which would which they would really want clinicians to know? What would be your biggest piece of advice to new clinicians with limited knowledge of autism? Okay, I saw this one coming in, and I wrote down three points. So that was <laughs> thank you for asking me, Maria. Um, I, I so I'm not going to give one golden nugget. I'll give a gold, a silver, and a bronze. Um, <laughs> so I think my gold is don't make assumptions. Yes. Um, based on what you have learned and what you have read about any other human being. So when a person walks into a room, they are a human being. So therefore, don't expect a child in particular, I suppose, if you're dealing with children, um, to enter your world and um, pick up on their cues and wait to be invited into their world. Um, and, and don't, um, you know, stop checking them off against a visual checklist in your head and actually take the time to enter into their interests. Um, and I suppose most importantly, seek out autistic people. If you don't know about autism and if you don't know about autistic people and you're going to be working in that area, then you need to find the information and the experts are the people who are autistic. Seek autistic people out, seek out their literature. There's plenty of it. Um, and I suppose that that would be my chief recommendation. Thank you, Jody. Does anybody else want to add to that? You're happy with that. That was that was really helpful. Thank you. Um, so the next thing is, uh, it says here, as a speech and language therapist whose role can sometimes be to support an autistic person uh, with information about how the neurotypical world works and how neurotypical people socially communicate. I struggle to balance providing this information without creating implicit pressure to do these behaviors and to mask, for example, social skills training. It's particularly difficult for children when the parent or teacher often may want the child to learn to mask for their own self-protection and participation with others. Any suggestions? I don't know who wants to answer that one. <laughs> it's a difficult one. Elaine, do you want to go ahead? Yeah. Speech and language therapist? Yeah, I can. I, I, I know where you're coming from. So thanks for asking the question. And I suppose um, it's ableism. And I think about this all the time, you know. Um, so the teacher in school says, you know, he can't be moving his hands like that. He's going to get bullied. So we need to actually force him to dismiss his need to sensory regulate his own authentic body language so that other people can feel comfortable being around this person. That is ableism. And when we do things like that as society and say that that is okay, then we are feeding stigma, which feeds masking, which feeds the mental health difficulties. So whenever we are worried about the mental health difficulties of autistic people, we actually have to look at what a society we have created you know so all the time I have conversations with 
teachers about these kind of things. You know, for example, a little boy who is his ears are bleeding because the teacher uses a, a tambourine to um, call everybody to attention and he's like having a trauma reaction. And then she says, well, it works for everybody else, so I'm not changing it. That's ableism. You know, and I think as a society, we really need to start talking more about ableism because then that will flip this narrative about um, forcing autistic people to just stay quiet, have quiet hands, make eye contact, just so that everybody else feels comfortable and doesn't feel a, a need to reject or victimize or isolate that person who's different. I mean, I maybe I'm an eternal optimist, perhaps. Maybe I'm, I'm not there yet. You know, maybe I, I'm not a realist, but at the end of the day, I've seen the harm done by that type of approach. I hear endlessly from autistic people who talk about the harm done from a behavioral approach, a social skills training approach. And I suppose I'll just give you a week. Um, you should uh, check out the Neurodiversity Therapist Collective on Facebook. It's also a website and it has endless information on pro neurodiversity um, support for autistic people. And there's specific advice around how you support a, an autistic person with pragmatic language and uh, communication skills that is pro neurodiversity that is a, not um, social skills training. So you can talk about perspective taking. So you can say, you know, when you say to the teacher, well, teacher, you're actually wrong about that. Um, what's the perspective of the teacher? What's your perspective? So when you say that, the, the teacher's perspective is this. So, um, so you give the child information about how that might be perceived, but then it's the child's decision to how they respond. And we have to be very, very careful about really coercing uh, young children to actually do that quicker, you know, to, to stay quite quicker, to hold in that impulsive thought or that actually righteous thought. Maybe they usually are right, saying the, the right and correct thing, but maybe it's just the, the adult doesn't expect that. You know, so I, I really feel that we just have to stand up against that. I think to be for to build a better future for everybody, a more inclusive society is one where we really stamp out ableism. Thank you, Elaine. Does anybody else want to comment on that? OK. Um, there is a question here saying, can the, can the panel comment on the co-occurrence of autism and personality disorders? How frequently do they co-occur or how do you differentiate? That's a tricky one. Yeah, sure I, don't, <laughs> I don't know yeah. if anybody wants to answer that one. Um, so maybe just as um, one of uh, both myself and Ashling are both trainee clinical psychologists. Exactly. And um, I do think that it's a really, really important question to ask, but um, what I might suggest actually is that our next webinar series um, on next week is around co-occurring conditions and that mm -hmm. we have um, clinicians who are even more specialised than ourselves speaking um, to this. So what I might suggest is maybe um, people registering for that um, and maybe having um, another expert speak to that. Yeah, yeah, good. Yeah, that's very good and yeah. um, a very good point. Um, there's another question here, which is saying, um, as diagnostic tools and criteria are based on theories like extreme male brain, um, or mostly kind of aimed at, at, at I suppose, at, at men, um, what changes would panelists suggest that clinicians could do? In the I, might, I might just comment briefly on that yeah. one. Because it, there's been a lot of questions about tools and about you know assessment tools. And I suppose that the, for me, the key thing to remember is it's an assessment process. And the most important thing is that it's a collaborative process between the clinician and the person who's you know presented requesting the assessment. And a lot of the tools that I've mentioned have been a huge variety of them, and you know, there's more than you've even come up today, but they're to help to gather information. You know, their the purpose is to help to gather information, 
you know, to, to create a picture, to help to create a picture of the individual who, as I said, who's presented. But it, it's much more about it being a collaborative process. And, you know, as I said, those tools, questionnaires, et cetera, et cetera, help to, to, to kind of elicit the information. But the ultimate goal is to have enough information for it to be a collaborative process and to, you know, it being there's no tick box or no questionnaire that it, it you know it is all about you know the individual presentation but in it, while you're also looking at you know the criteria for the diagnosis i don't know if that quite answered the question but can yeah, i just add to that ahead, yeah. because I, I think that i think that's so relevant and i think obviously it's important that you know, clinicians can correctly diagnose, but I think it's also important to maybe think about how you start to lobby for a rewriting of those criteria to let women in, because I know as somebody who's been through a diagnostic process and who had to answer those questions that were written through a clearly male lens, that in itself is quite a debilitating process. So you feel at all times slightly fraudulent um, mm -hmm. for being there as a woman. And so I think to that end, even though I, th I trust in the clinicians and I trust in the people making the diagnosis, I think it's very important that we write more inclusive criteria and more inclusive um, diagnostic tools. So I don't know who's going to do that, but somebody in this webinar can do it. Well, may, may, may I just add is that the first time I came across that, you know, extreme male brain theory, it really amused me because, you know, being sent off to school, I thought, why on earth are they putting me with these awful girls? You know, I miss my father and brothers, not my so much my mother and, you know, new sisters and grandmother to become a nursery at home at the arrival of new children. And I just thought, oh, God, I can't bear to be with all these girls all the time. Give me a break. Open the window. All this natter and interaction. I couldn't bear it. So when I when I saw this, you know, extreme male brain, I thought, yep, that's probably me. You know? <laughs> so I it's, it's challenging and the whole thing of gender and where you identify. Um, and certainly in analysis, I, I found it very illuminating to explore that whole spectrum. You know, I won't say what demonstration this psychology club in London, but the whole group of very different people, you know, lined up in front of it. And the person giving a presentation was very androgynous. And she said, here I am in the middle. You know, this is the whole kind of spectrum of what you've got. And I found that, yep, okay, I know where I am now. Great, lovely. So the whole, it was a demonstration of diversity. So, you know, it's... Uh, it's, it's just interesting, you know, I, I find it kind of, I just thought, oh yeah, that sounds right, you know, yeah, but obviously that was a simplistic take on it and a very amateur take on it, you know. Oh, absolutely. Yeah, that's, it is very relevant and I hope, I hope you're right. I hope maybe down the line in a few years we will have more appropriate, I suppose, yes. assessments. Yes, yeah. 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 Um, did anybody else want to, are you okay with if I move on? That we just have time for a few more questions. So one of the questions is saying, um, very interesting about hearing how good it is to be told you're autistic. I believe that too. How, as a psychologist, could one approach this with parents? So that's for, for I think that would be good if we could hear from, from like different people, because maybe different people have different views, but. Yeah, I might. Um speak to that first <laughs> as I'm unmuted um, so I think as um, I think Elaine as Jody, Una like I think everyone um, Louise as well have, have mentioned um, taking um, I suppose the this the strengths-based approach and not seeing not seeing this as a negative as a um, somehow it's a detrimental thing for your child to be autistic it's not there's um, there's so much um, richness and it you know it's it's who they are it's their it's more than just a label it's the, the person it's a part of who they are and in some ways by denying them that you are denying them maybe as I think Elaine has pointed out their identity and um, so I suppose trying to speak to parents about that and again it, this is a challenge that we do face is um, because often they do come to clinical services it's through they're, they're seeing this as um, you know there it's a CAMS or it's an adult mental health service and it can be hard sometimes to maybe differentiate that this isn't 
on the one hand why isn't this a diagnosis how is this an identity and and um, that's our challenge um as clinicians and then trying to to present it in that that strength space the positive perspective and um, is something that that takes time for for parents as well and um, it can it, they i suppose are also going through a journey of trying to accept their young person with this new information um, and i suppose what's what's been really what can be very helpful um is having the support of other people so that autistic community, you know, that Jody mentioned um, and Una as well, that there, there's other people like you out there um, and knowing that you're not alone in this, that there is this identity, that there's others and um, can be really helpful and, and supportive. Um, so I think that's um, kind of one perspective. I don't know, maybe um, if anyone else would like to speak to that. Joe, did you want to say something there? Yeah, I can speak briefly to it, kind of having been through the diagnostic process with my son. So receiving that information about him as well as about myself before I knew it about myself, if that makes sense. Mm -hmm. um, and I suppose, you know, one of the things that we did when we um, told our son that he was autistic was we provided really positive role models. Um, and yeah. so, A, I think that clinicians, if they are changing their approach to neurodiversity, have a responsibility to retrain the media about that because I think the the media's approach and and language around autism and neurodiversity can be so negative and mm -hmm. um, you know see so if I open the paper and see nobody wants their child to be diagnosed with autism and my child is being diagnosed with autism then of course I think that's a tragedy mm -hmm. so mm -hmm. so clinicians and the media need to work together and autistic people need to work together to to change the language that we use around um difference um, so that it stops being so negative. Um, but also, I think, actually, that there's a lot to be said for somebody. So, you know, we came across a series of videos called Ask an Autistic, and we came across them by accident. No clinician gave us those, but they were the most valid piece of learning that we did in the early days. So if, if a clinician had said to us, your child is autistic, here's an autistic person talking about all the stuff that you need to know in the next 10 weeks, mm -hmm. it would have been a game changer. Um, and and also always to 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 reiterate that it doesn't nothing about a diagnosis changes the person in front of you, and um, so it's just a little bit of learning rather than a change in them fundamentally. Yeah, I would agree. I I would tend to, to direct people towards stuff that has been written written by other autistic people rather than you know call it journals or you know kind of um clinical books or but towards articles or books or facebook pages or you know groups that um that are run by or written by autistic people thanks jacinta i don't know uh louise or ashley do you have anything else to add there yeah i guess as jacinta's kind of touched on before that assessment is a process and it should be collaborative. So there shouldn't be this kind of built up into this feedback appointment. There should be feedback all along. Parents and the individual themselves should be involved in this. They shouldn't be taking all these tests, scoring them privately away. It should be sharing feedback as we go along. So it's building up the picture of what may, what, how we may understand what's going on for the young person. Um, one of the yeah. queries there, which which I don't know if um, if if maybe you wanted to answer there, it just says um, one of the attendees is saying our service does not complete a cognitive if not clinically warranted. Um, so if a child is doing okay academically, I'm not a psychologist. Would the panel here have an opinion on that? I feel like I'm jumping in. I'm going to just answer that one quickly because I did mention that in a sense, but one of the reasons why we do do it for, for all children, we include it in our assessment process for all children, but it's because the, the, the profile gives valu valuable information. So it's not necessarily like a, a child could have a, an overall average IQ, but it's the breakdown of the profile that gives valuable information as part of the, as part of the process. So we wouldn't do, say, a full um, academics piece if there isn't any query of any difficulties academically as well. But if there was a, any query, say, around dyslexia or dyscalculia as well, we'd do the full academics piece as well. But we always do the cognitive bit 
in terms of the valuable information that the profile can give. Thanks. Thanks for answering that. That's very helpful. There was another question for the panel that was, it's a difficult one, but it's saying, how can we improve access to support, including diagnosis and post diagnostic support from health, education, et cetera, for autistic people and their families? Because a lot of people are struggling to get assessed and there's massive waiting lists. And once you get assessed, sometimes people aren't actually offered any intervention, any support mm -hmm. when they're looking for support. And mm -hmm. um, so this is a very, very difficult question, but I'm going to ask it anyway. Does anybody have any ideas? No, I'm definitely not an expert, but I think this is definitely a wider issue with the healthcare system because, you, yeah, we need a full public health system that has good investment to try and decrease the, you know, the time spent on waiting lists. I think there also might need to be some culture changes within because, again, this happened to my parents 10 years ago. I don't know if this has changed, but they brought me to CAMS, not the autism service, just because they were a bit confused. They just wanted advice. But even on the phone call my mom had with the, like, the service, she was like, I don't know what to do. But the nurse is just like, you're the parents. Like, you should know what to do. <laughs> and then they... Apart and then apparently at the end of the assessment, they're like, oh, she's actually like really lovely. She's not autistic, but they didn't give my parents any further support. So I yeah. hope it has changed in 10 years. But yeah, I think not only do we need the government to invest in the health service in general and give more funding to mental health services, but I think, yeah, there needs to be a cultural change in how the professionals there view autism and understand autism and stuff. Mm -hmm. Can I ask you, Louise, in your opinion, should we have some autistic people on these teams? Like there is teams, you know, in Ireland, say run by the, the like the, what they're called, they're called disability teams and they have psychology and speech and language and, you know, OT and stuff like that. And they're supposed to be doing the assessments and then providing supports to families you know with uh well it's it's actually for under 18s i mean sh do you think there should be autistic people on those teams i feel as though there should be yeah and like i actually know of autistic people who are you know training in psychology yeah there's an account i follow on twitter she has quite a few followers and she's in the uk but i think she's training as a mental health nurse so and she's autistic so yeah i think there should be uh, like the involvement of autistic people in this field because this is their lived experience you know yeah absolutely i think so too i don't know what other oh yeah oh, absolutely absolutely because you know um you know the the deep interest you know many people um would have them become develop into actual psychologists themselves um, it's a, a really true for value if you meet somebody like that who really knows what they're from the inside as well as from the outside professionally what they're encountering. So they really have added give added value to the whole, you know, um, medical area, you know. So generally speaking, I think you'd have to be unlucky to encounter one because they would be so rare. But the added diagnostic value they give if you brought somebody in a panel and said you know is there a question about this person's thing you'd be able to relate to them you know in a way i'm not sure how practical you know how practically you could organize it but there's no doubt the added value of um an autistic voice there would be could be quite crucial because you know um you know, you said there a moment about, oh, she's lovely. She couldn't possibly be autistic, you know, and uh, as if they expected somebody, you know, nasty or horrible. You know, people are are fine. You know, it's you you just need uh, an autistic voice there, and they certainly contribute hugely to any diagnostic panel. I would think, you know. Thank you for that. Does anybody else want to say anything there about that one? 
No? I guess uh, just a tiny thing, but I suppose if the Department of Health and the Department of Education were somewhat more connected and spoke to each other, <laughs> yes. then we might have a better health and education system for all children, not just for yes. autistic children. Um, because also it can be really exhausting for an autistic child to be in school and then they're expected to go to this therapy and that therapy. Whereas if that was happening in within the school setting and was part of their their day, then they could just come home and be at home, you know. Yeah. And so I think a, a little bit more of a, a joined up approach would be a wonderful aspiration. Absolutely. Thank you. That's very, very good point. Um, there are actually a few people have asked, could Louise give the title of the Pearson and Rose uh, 2021 reference? We've been looking for it and we can't find it. It's me. Um, it's yeah, concept, sorry, yeah. yeah, conceptual yeah. analysis of masking. Let me just check it up here. I'll get it exactly. Thank you. That's very helpful. Yeah. Sorry. Can't type that fast. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah. Oh, yeah. I think so. Yeah. I got it nice. So. And it, there's actually a preprint available, so it's open access on a preprint, and then it's um, published with um, autism and adulthood, and it's um, you know it's not open access, but the preprint is available if you search for it. So a conceptual analysis of autistic masking, and then um, understanding the narrative of stigma and the illusion of choice, and it's Dr. Amy Pearson and Kieran Rose. It's January 2021. Oh, gosh. Great. Thank you. And can I just say that we have a message here to say that it's Una's birthday today. Is that right? Oh, yes. <laughs> Happy birthday. Oh, dear. Good for you. <laughs> 72 today. My God, I feel oh, like about a, two probably. <laughs> what a birthday present you got today. It is. It is. <laughs> it really is. Very Thank kind. you. Join us on your birthday. <laughs> I know it was a lovely coincidence when I saw the date. I thought, I don't believe this, you know. <laughs> Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you. It's a great no, way to celebrate. Yeah. It's such good you. company, you know. Thank you. That's lovely. Thank you so much. Um, I'm afraid we're running a bit late. So I think that's probably all that we have time for this evening. Um, but I know we're going to be, we're going to have a, a, two more. Um, Yes. online webinars so hopefully some of the questions that we didn't get through tonight might come up again and yeah. um, so I just wanted to sincerely thank our wonderful panel of contributors to this evening's events and we'll do our best to get the recording of this event online at the uh, St John of God Research Foundation.ie as soon as possible and I just want to remind you about our next event in the series which is going to take place on the 3rd of February and it focuses on the co-occurring conditions that came up actually in some of the questions here. Um, and I've just been reminded to say if you do need any CPD points you should email autism at psychologicalsociety.ie for those of you that are looking for them. But thank you so much. I really enjoyed tonight and I hope you did too. Yes, I did. It was great. Thank you very much. Thank you. Oh, my goodness. Thank goodness.